All right, back to Judges. We looked at the introductory uh, material as we concluded last time. And of course, from the, uh, the title and getting into the book itself, we start to think in terms of the major themes that uh, are in the book. And of course, the first major theme is, is these human characters that uh, God raises up in Israel's history that uh, obviously become the, the, the key men as far as this portion of Scripture is concerned. Uh, significantly, it is in uh, chapter 2, six times in an introduction where the uh, writer introduces us to these men. Uh, beginning in chapter 2, verse 16, Yahweh raised up judges who delivered them, that is Israel, from the land, uh, from the hands of those who plundered them, that, yet they did not listen to their judges. They played the harlot. Verse 18, the Lord raised up judges. The Lord was with the judge and delivered them. But he came about, verse 19, that when the judge died, they would turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers. And, and we'll come back and, and uh, see that uh, verses 11 to 22 give us a summary introduction by the narrator to get us prepared for the narration that we're going to read of what happened historically, uh, the raising up of, well, the raising up of these judges in response to, uh, to Israel's uh, sin and uh, God's judgment of delivering them over into the hands of their enemies. They would cry out. God would raise up the judge. And yet, as we see that uh, when the judge died, they would uh, turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers. Um, and uh, so these are the, uh, the judges that God raises up that plays a very important uh, role. And of course, he, he, he brings up the fact in, in verse 17, they would not listen to their, to their judges. That having raised them up, that uh, these judges would have a position of uh, leadership and uh, that even during their lives, uh, Israel would not uh, respond to them. But then he's raised up a leader in Moses, he's raised up, raised up a leader in Joshua, and Israel of those generations was not uh, completely responsive to those leaders as well. Same thing takes place and continues on in the period of the judges. So these are the men. Now, when we get into the actual narrative, and uh, Block points this out in his commentary, good observation, that the term judge is never used for any of these men. It is the verb that now is used, that we see their activity in judging Israel. And I have uh, listed that there for you, that, uh, that the Spirit of the Lord 310, for instance, came upon Othniel, and he judged Israel. And uh, when he went out to war, the Lord gave uh, the, uh, the king of Mesopotamia into his hand, so he ruled over Cushan Rashathim, the, the king of Mesopotamia. And, and you can go along, I've listed the verses for you there, where judges are told these men that they judged. And of course, uh, uh, you, you find out when you get to, uh, to chapter 11 through, uh, through 16 that the final two judges that the book will concentrate on, Jephthah and uh, Samson, that it will say a number of times how they judged the, uh, the people. So the judges, the, the noun that the author uses in his summarization comes from the, the verb which he uses as he goes through the, uh, uh, through the narration to show that this is exactly what these men did. Now the question comes, well, okay, how exactly are we to understand these judges? Where did they come from? And uh, what we, we see is that as we go through the Torah and the book of Joshua, that God had already made allowance for judges to, uh, to come forth within Israel. Uh, chapter 18 of Exodus is very, very vital. This is where we read that, 
that Moses was the first judge over the people. So in Exodus 18, 13, it came about the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. Now, within this judgment, what we see is, is that, all right, if anyone had a, a situation needed adjudicating within Israel, they would bring it before Moses. At this point, there is no written codification of any kind of uh, commandments and ordinances and judgments. That is where an adjudication has been made that then uh, becomes a pattern for, for the same kind of uh, situations that would take place within the future. And basically this is where Jethro tells Moses, if you keep doing this, you're going you're gonna to just wear yourself out. You can't keep judging two and a half million people, you, you know. Who do you think you are, William Rehnquist? Do you think, you know, uh, our Supreme Court, you know, just, uh, um, head of the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, you know, it's going to wear you out, all right? Just, uh, you can't do it. And it's interesting that Moses was about 80 years of age when this was taking place, just like Rehnquist is today. And we're, we're seeing a toll that even within our system that obviously it would take upon the health of an individual. You can't do this. And uh, so, uh, verse 19, now listen to me, I'll give you counsel. And God be the judge, you be the people's representative. And you bring the disputes to God. Then teach them the statutes and law, make them know the way in which they are to walk, walk and the work that you are to do. Furthermore, select out of the people able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain. And you place them as leaders over thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens. Let them judge the people. And let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves will judge so that it will be easier for you and they will bear the burden with you. All right. As you, as you take a look at the peoples, now he doesn't use the term tribes and, and clans and families. He uses the, you know, the numerical foundation. In other words, break, break the people down in smaller units and you appoint men, worthy men, men who fear God, men who can't be bribed like you, Moses, and, and you allow them to judge. Now, you teach the people and give these judges uh, counsel from God, give them the laws and the commandments, the instruction, and then let them adjudicate the minor issues and uh, you, Moses, only deal with the, the major issues that uh, set the precedent for the, for the people and for these, these judges. And uh, we, we see that in verse 24, Moses listened to his father-in-law, did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all of Israel, made them heads over the people. And they judged the people at all times. A difficult dispute, they, but the, this, the difficult dispute they would bring to Moses. But every minor dispute, they themselves would judge. And God uses this counsel, all right? You need to, to give to, to Israel these directives that are to guide their life. That's what they need. And then we see in chapter 19 and following, that's exactly what God does. God at Sinai gives to Moses the directives which are now going to, to govern Israel. And uh, the people, we've already seen at the end of chapter 20 after hearing the, uh, the 10 major words that Yahweh had to speak to them, say, you go and be our representative and you find out what Yahweh wants and you pass it on to us and you, you be our representative, you be the mediator basically between we the people and with Yahweh. And so... And so God, uh, uh, historically, this council of Jethro becomes foundational of what God had planned to do as far as uh, Israel was concerned. And, and Moses has uh, chosen these, uh, these men. And uh, this seems to be also implicit in what is taking place in chapter 11 of uh, the book of uh, Numbers, that uh, here is a place where where, uh, where God uh, 
Uh, as, as Moses says, I'm not able to bear this people. All right. Uh, uh, verse 16, Yahweh says to Moses, Gather for me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people, their officers. Bring them and let them take their stand with you. Then I will come down and speak with them there, and I will take of the spirit that's upon you. And I will put the spirit upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you shall not bear it alone. These are men that are going to help Moses in the direction and uh, bearing of the burden of the people. And uh, implicit here that they need the same Holy Spirit that the Lord has given to Moses in their dealing with the people as well. Now this it's probably not so much as a continuing, a continuing office that's going to develop within Israel, as is going to be seen about these, these judges, as the fact that this time period again, God shows to Moses, all right, there are men whom you need that I will raise up and you appoint to help you within the task of uh, leading and directing the people. Well, this continues on as you come to... Uh, to Deuteronomy, and uh, we'll jump ahead to chapter 16 and chapter 17. We say that uh, there are these leaders of the tribes, and uh, yet Deuteronomy now makes it very, very plain that even after what God had established through Moses of Sinai, and reiterated as they left Sinai, and, uh, and uh, in Numbers chapter 11, uh, the fact that uh, there are to be these judges in and these judges are tied in, as you see in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 18 to 20, with the tribes. So Moses speaks Israel, saying, You shall appoint for yourselves judges and officers in all your towns, which the Lord your God is giving you, all the gates where the judgment is to take place, that Yahweh your God is giving you, according to your tribes. And they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. Right, and that then gives the qualifications of the tribes again, like Exodus chapter uh, uh, 18, those who don't pervert justice, those who don't take bribes, uh, those who, uh, who really practice uh, following the, uh, the Lord. And then almost as in the time of Moses in chapter 17, uh, verses uh, 8 to 13, if there's any case too difficult at this local level, then uh, verse 9, you shall come to the priest of the Levites or the judge in those days, and you shall inquire, and they will declare to you the verdict in the case that, uh, that God is going, to, is going to raise up one of the priests of the tribe of Levi, whether it was the high priest or not, is debated. And this judge, this, he's going to supremely raise within the land, along with the priest, a judge. And they together will hear and adjudicate the major decisions, much as it was within the time of, of Moses. Basically, this is the Supreme Court, but with only two individuals. And, uh, and then the terms of uh, the verdict will become basically a judgment that the people are to follow from that, from that point. So that, uh, uh, that these judges that are going to, to be appointed within the people, among the people, uh, there is also going to be a judge that God is going to raise up to, to also be with the, with the priest probably at the central sanctuary location, the place that all Israel comes to worship, and there they can bring their cases as, as well. And uh, then we see as we get into uh, the book of uh, Joshua that in the, in the second generation, and all this brings up is that Israel had established these, uh, these judges in their, their midst as he, he speaks uh, concerning uh, Israel, he will speak about the, uh, uh, the leaders and uh, their judges 
For instance, 24, 1, he called for the elders, for their heads and their judges and their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Right? And uh, one of the major responsibilities they were was, was to judge, was to adjudicate uh, as far as, as uh, cases that uh, were involved as far as the, the Israelites were concerned. Now, that certainly is an element that had developed among these judges. And, and Israel was aware that they needed these kinds of men in every town at their gates. And, and that tied in, obviously, where they lived with their tribe. That was the preeminent place that God was uh, going to raise up uh, these judges. And then the fact that, uh, that God would raise up a supreme judge. Uh, to act in, in concert with the, uh, the priest from the tribe of Levi in the adjudication of these matters within, within Israel. And so this, this pattern was already established. Yet, when you get into the book of Judges, what you notice is, is that, all right, not only did these men that God raised up, and uh, that as we go through the book of Judges, he raises them up and tells us basically from what tribe they came from. So that they are, are men that, uh, that first are raised up from the tribes and then deliver for the tribes that has an impact upon all, uh, all Israel. Uh, yet it is, it is interesting, he, he, he uses this institution that has uh, begun to add to the, the role of these particular men that are seen in Judges, also the military aspect of deliverance, that uh, they become not only leaders over the people as far as uh, secular leadership is concerned, don't forget what's in the Torah and also seem within uh, Joshua as well that along with judges, there is also the whole priestly system that has uh, been set up as well uh, for the priest to teach Israel and lead Israel in their, in their responsibilities toward God. But along with that, that uh, their priesthood are these, these laymen, if I can use a term we use today, these non-priests that arise out of the tribes that are associated with the priests, helping to, to take what the priests have taught as far as God's Torah, God's directive is concerned, and helping then that directive to be seen within the corporate life of Israel beginning at the lowest level in the, uh, the towns and uh, working its way up through the tribes so that as the tribes are faithful to the Lord, ultimately all Israel would be faithful in this way to the Lord. And, uh, and uh, so, and, and it's very interesting, of course, in Judges that the that the role of the priest is not emphasized at all here. The basis as you go through Judges, it's not until we get actually into the early chapters of Samuel that we realize, that, okay, along with these men that we've read about in Judges, there were other men from priestly families and priestly background that got also raised up, you know, to judge. And uh, Eli and uh, Samuel, of course, being those, those, those two men. But what, uh, what is expanded in Judges, and, and really <sighs> prepares us for ultimately the, the responsibility of the judge is going to to culminate in the person and the raising up by God of a king. That uh, there is a sense that in Judges, we start to see, if I can use an Essexism here, 
I haven't seen there's any commentaries, but uh, I would call these men a bridge where Moses and Joshua have exercised leadership over all of Israel together, all the tribes coming together. And then in the book of Judges, we see these, these men raised up by God, and using my term, who become mini kings that are preparing Israel for their need for a human king. They're human mini kings that God raises up and uses first to lead the people in victory, to deliver the people as God's instruments, and then seeking to lead the people in the ways of Yahweh, assuming, obviously, also with, and we can't assume it, but should have been raised up, obviously, with a faithful priesthood. Uh, Block gives us this, this idea of how the, uh, the concept of uh, judge has, uh, has, uh, has focus as far as the book of uh, Judges is uh, concerned. He has this little chart here that, all right, the, basically the judge, he judges, that is, he both rules and governs and exercises leadership. He exercises leadership both in internal affairs doing what we've already seen within the Torah. And that is being basically an adjudicator in uh, leading Israel. But that adjudication follows as we take a look both with the summary and the narratives. In fact, he first leads in external affairs. He delivers. He's raised up to deliver the people from their adversaries. And then they were to follow his leadership. Now what we see within the narrative of Judges is Israel is more than happy to allow the judge to fight and lead them into battle and to be the instrument of bringing deliverance. But as we've already seen with Moses and Joshua, they are not as quick to respond to the leadership of the judge in internal affairs. And certainly when you get to, to Samuel, and we'll get to this passage and look at it more detailly, but in 1 Samuel chapter 8, when, uh, when Israel asked for a judge, it is very interesting in verses uh, 5 and 6. This is what they say to Samuel, of, of 1 Samuel 8. Verse 5, now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, verse 6, give us a king to judge us. And then verse 7, listen to the voice of the people. They have not rejected you, but rejected me from being king over them. They want a human king now because they see in these human judges that God has raised up. He is the ultimate king, the ultimate melech, the one who exercises the authority over Israel. Now they want, as they have seen these kings, that, these judges, that the king has raised up for them and allowed them to exercise authority both in battle and then uh, after the deliverance. That's what we want. We want those kind, that kind of an individual to now be given and invested with authority to rule and reign over us. So just keep that in the back of mind. But notice how when they think in terms of a king, they're thinking in terms of a king to do what they have seen the judges do for the uh, past uh, 300 uh, plus years of their history. All right? we, we, we now know that God is willing to raise up individuals who will judge us All right? to fight our battles for us, to lead us into battle. And then to, uh, to give us direction. Uh, but uh, we don't want to keep waiting for the Lord to, uh, you know, wonder who these, these men are going to be. Set us a king. We want to be like all the other nations that has a dynasty. That we know exactly where that authority is invested and uh, who is to be king over us. So this is the, uh, the background and then the... And then the realization of what uh, God does. He, 
He has developed this, 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 this office that uh, exercises a, an authority over the people and uh, that uh, develops from the initial judicial role that is seen in the Torah and Joshua into a more extensive role when you get into Judges being a bridge to creating in Israel a desire that, uh, that well, that God's kingship would ultimately be exercised through a human king. But we'll come back to that when we get to Samuel. We want to take a look at this, uh, this historical period. And God was at work in, in, in his people and uh, preparing the way for his future plan and purpose, even in what is taking place within this book. Behind this book, like all books in the narrative, is the sovereign hand of God. That uh, God is orchestrating the events for the, uh, the ultimate outworking of his plan and his purpose. But here's the background of the judges. Now, when you get in the book itself, uh, and most, uh, most men will speak about, all right, there are major judges and minor judges, kind of like the major prophets and the minor prophets uh, later on and, and the latter prophets. You know, the guys who wrote the big books and the guys who wrote the, the little books. All right, well, there's, 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 there's the judges who did a lot and got a lot of narrative, and then there's the judges who well, we don't know exactly what they did because they got a little bit of narrative. Uh, Block probably gives a little more helpful uh, statement, not that, uh, okay, you're, you're just a minor judge, so, you know, you run into Jehar in the millennium and say, oh, you're one of those minor judges. He said, well, if you were alive in my day, I wasn't that minor, my friend. <laughs> oh, okay, well, the Spirit just didn't tell us a whole lot about you. Well, I, I understand that, but, but uh, you know, in my day, I was pretty major. You know, God raised me up for you know, a very important role. So, Locke says, probably better to use the term primary and secondary judge. In other words, when it comes to the narrative, these are the judges that the narrator primarily concentrates on. But he reminds us that there are other judges as well that uh, he does not devote as much of the text to. Um, if we were going to have a little written exercise on Wednesday, I would have asked you, who were the six primary judges in Israel? If you want to play Bible trivia sometime, remember who the secondary judges were. But at this point, I'd be happy if you just knew the primary judges. If you read Judges, you'll get them down. Othniel, Ahud, Deborah, and yes, she did judge Israel. Gibeon, Jephthah, Samson. These are the primary judges. This is where the narrative is going to concentrate. Yet we also got some judges, you just get a verse or two, and of course they are listed there too, Shamgar, Tola, J.R. Ibzan and uh, uh, Elon and Abdon. Now, as we are introduced, and we will come back to this within the outline, but in chapters 1 and 2, both from a military and religious standpoint, what we see as foundational to understand the period of the judges is a note that's already been sounded in Joshua, and that is the incomplete obedience of Israel. Chapter 1, as we already talked about, now looks at the tribes. It's the tribe's responsibility with the, uh, the death of Joshua, all right, now who is going to go first and, uh, and uh, begin to, to, to drive out the Canaanites from the territory that God has allotted to them. It is Judah that uh, is that uh, lead tribe, and, and Yahweh is the one who says, Judah first. And uh, Judah, through the example or the encouragement of Caleb and then the, 
and then the, the work of, uh, of Othniel uh, begins that process, but uh, we, are, uh, we are reminded as they, uh, as they begin the process, verse 19, that they did not continue it to completion. They did not drive out the inhabitants of the valleys. From the human perspective, what led them to do this is because they had iron chariots. And they were not willing to take on the, the Canaanites because of a perceived military mismatch. mismatch. Now, it's very interesting that by the time you get to Judges 4, you, can, you find out that God has his ways of negating the military strength of, of chariots. A good rainstorm with plenty of mud is all that is needed to stop a chariot in its tracks. And Yahweh does just happen to control the storm. So, but from the human point of view, why didn't they continue on? Because they didn't want to take on the Canaanites militarily because they still got the chariots. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, the battles that have been fought under Joshua have been fought within the highlands where, okay, chariots don't do a whole lot of good in, you know, rolling terrain. But you get down the lowlands, you get in that flatland, chariots now, that's an insurmountable obstacle. So what we're seeing is, is that Judah does exactly, you know, what took place at Kadesh Barnea. We're not able. They're greater than we are. And uh, so they don't complete the, the conquest, and then that begins a sad litany. Sorry to say that uh, Judah was to be a leader, but it was the wrong kind of leader. And so the sad litany then goes, just as Judah, so the other tribes also did not drive out the Canaanites. The Canaanites uh, remain. But it's not just their incomplete obedience at the military uh, level in chapter uh, 2. We find out exactly what God said would take place. Takes place. That is, they failed to drive out the Canaanites. So God says in verse 3, I will not drive them out before you. They'll become as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. So that in verse 11, after the death of Joshua and the elders who survived him, the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of Yahweh and served the Baals. Their gods became a snare. So that the lack of obedience militarily leads to the lack of obedience spiritually. God just didn't say drive the Canaanites out, but destroy their religious paraphernalia. You didn't. They're still among you. Their gods will become a snare. And that's exactly what takes place. And so we have the incomplete obedience of Israel militarily, at least their incomplete obedience spiritually. And uh, they turn to the Baals. They forsake Yahweh. And uh, yet, as, as the writer brings up, that serve Baal for a time until, until they'd be sold in the hands of, or given in the hands of the plunderers and plundered, and they didn't like the consequences, then they cry back to the Yahweh. Yahweh would deliver them only for the cycle to continue to repeat itself again and again during the period of the judges. They turn to the balls, forsake the Lord, not like the consequences, cry out to Yahweh, he would deal with it, but they wouldn't stay following Yahweh. They would slowly but surely just regress back to serving the balls and the, the Ashtaras, the, uh, the male and the female deity of, uh, of the, the Canaanites. And so this incomplete obedience at the end of chapter 2 leads into the summary. And notice I've placed it for you where it is seen in chapter 2, where the summary is given. And then, Al, you can see that summary working out again, again, again within the major cycles, that is, of the primary judges. 
Uh, he doesn't deal with the cycle as far as the secondary judges, but he does with the primary judges. Okay, you got the pattern. Understand the pattern. And, and, and the author directed by the Holy Spirit says, look, here essentially is what happened. Time and time again, six times. All right, now you got the pattern in mind. You're ready to read the narrative. All right, now see how, all right, different tribes, different geographical locations, uh, different nations that God raises up to torment Israel, different judges raised up, but same basic pattern six times. Makes judges, in one sense, very easy to preach. In another sense, you realize you say it in chapter 2 and you got six more times you're going to go through this. And, uh, and it's just like Israel as you read it. As they read it, just the modern day reader, they kind of get, it gets old after the second. Get me back to Joshua and the conquest. You know, the positive stuff. It's just one cycle after another as far as Israel is concerned. Well, the basic pattern is given. Israel served the Baals and forsook Yahweh and provoked Yahweh to anger. So they forsook Yahweh and served the Baal and the Ashras. That's Israel's predominant sin, turning to idolatry. So God did what? The anger of the Lord burned against them, gave them the hands of the plunderers who plundered them, sold them in the hand of their enemies so they could no longer stand before their enemies. Part of the curses in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. If you disobey, one of the consequences is what? I will not allow you to stand before your enemies. And you will not enjoy the plenty of the land. All right, so as you go through the book of Judges, who gets at these times of God giving the people into the hands of their enemies, who takes the crops? So it's not just military defeat, it's also physical hardship that God allows to come upon Israel. This is their servitude. To the, to the other nations. A servitude that, uh, that God says in verses uh, 21 to 23, why he, he left them there in order to test Israel to see whether they would keep the way of the Lord. So Yahweh allowed the nations to remain, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. That is completely as we have uh, spoken about on, on Wednesday. The giving wasn't Complete in one sense. It was complete in, one, in, in the sense of title of the land. It wasn't complete in the fact that every square inch of real estate had been taken. And Israel didn't take it, so the nations are left to test the, uh, the people. And they're in servitude. And so 2.18, uh, what takes place is that they would cry out. That uh, the Lord was moved to pity by the groaning because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. He was moved because they would respond to the hardships that then they were enduring. So God raised up a deliverer who delivered them. And then everything went well while the judge lived. For the Lord was with the judge, verse 18, and delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. The land had rest. For the Lord was moved to pity. But verse 19, it came about when the judge died, they would turn back and act more corruptly. It would be worse after the judge died than before. Now, certainly there is, and it's brought up that there is this cycle. You know, you can just kind of, you know, portray it as, you know, from, from sin to servitude to the supplication to the salvation. 
which is the deliverance, but I got to have my S's. Then the rest, which I say is security because I want my S's all the way through. All right, so <clears throat> I do massage the text a little bit to get my alliteration. But it's not just a cycle. He says, now when one cycle is complete, Israel turns back and the cycle begins all over again. But each time, Israel went back and did worse than had done pre been done previously. That the cycle is, a, in the end, a six-fold cycle that is like this. And that's exactly what you see again in the narrative. Because the judges that God raises up were men of their times. There is not only a decline that is taking place within the land, but as you read the account of the judges, what are you finding out as the judges, as spiritual leaders as well? What is Samson like compared to Othniel? And uh, we'll, we'll come and see from some of the earlier judges that uh, have a more positive uh, slant given to by the narrator that we finally come to the, <laughs> we might call it this way, the, the hot and cold, the black and white judge, Gideon. He's a fun person to preach on. And then you realize, well, after him, uh, the judges, yeah, they, they're raised up. God works through them. They deliver, but they're, they're not of the same spiritual caliber. Going back to, uh, to Othniel. In fact, I'm, I'm certainly glad that Hebrews 11.32 is in the Bible. Uh, because it's at this way I know that... Uh, That Samson and uh, Jep Jephthah and Samson were uh, were faithful men. Hebrews eleven thirty two. What more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, who by faith conquered kingdoms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I get particularly to, <laughs> and it's amazing, the one the writer chooses in the direction of the Spirit. Well, Othniel, Ehud, Deborah. And I, can, I can see their faith and faithfulness. Barak? Deborah, if you go with me, I'll fight. <laughs> but if you don't hold my hand, I can't go. Gideon, all right, there's a man of faith. Also said, well, I won't be the king, but well, make me an offer. I'd like a little bit of priestly authority here. Jephthah, we'll talk about Jephthah Samson. Time would fail me. You know what I want to say at this point? Take the time. Explain how these were men of faith. So yes, in, in Hebrews 11 are, are men of faith that we should learn lessons of how to trust God. So I come to Judges and Hebrews 11 gives me the warrant to say this is a narrative about them and and I've got to learn from what they face, how they trusted God in very, very difficult circumstances. Now, certainly it was difficult circumstances, and they did trust God. And uh, yet we, we certainly see that, that the level of that trust and the consequences of it for Israel is certainly declining as well. All right, and then just uh, 
very, very uh, quickly. Uh, certainly, uh, and uh, this is the way that uh, uh, you can read Psalm 106 and Nehemiah 9 that speak about the period of the judges. What basically was taking place during the period of the judges is that Israel was, was provoking Israel, as we've already seen from Judges chapter 2, to wrath. And yet, Yahweh responds. Now, it is not in... In uh, Judges explicitly itself, but I'm thankful for the 106th Psalm that uh, it speaks about how God again and again, not only during the period of the Judges, but before, that delivered his people. So as the psalmist speaks in verse 43, many times he would deliver them. They, however, were rebellious in their counsel, so they sank down in their iniquity. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry, and he remembered his covenant for their sake and relented according to greatness of his loving kindness. What covenant? What covenant did he remember. Well, as, uh, as you uh, go through the, uh, the psalm and uh, tie it in with what has uh, just gone, gone before. In Psalm 105, as he begins, how he remembered his covenant. Psalm 105, 9, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. Don't you read the judges and, and say, Lord, why don't you just give up on him? Away with people. Why do you keep responding and giving them deliverance? Why were they not consumed? Why do they come out of the period of the judges still being a people, still being a nation? Well, it's implied in Judges if you read Judges against what we've seen within the Torah. Because we realize even within the wilderness wandering, as we saw in Numbers chapter 23, is that the Abrahamic covenant lies behind the fact that uh, God continues to be with his people even in... Yeah, the midst of uh, their, uh, their sin and consequences, the people are not destroyed. In fact, uh, um, the glory of the numbers, that there is as many after in the second generation as previously in the first rebellious generation, it's Yahweh's protection. But what is the basis of his protection? Why does he keep coming to their aid? And... Uh, and allowing them to continue as a people. It comes out of this period and into the period of the kingship. It's because of the Abrahamic covenant. Why is Israel still a people today? When the Edomites and the Moabites and the Ammonites and all the other ites of the Old Testament are long since gone dispersed now and no one knows their alliance. Why is Israel still a people? Because of the Abrahamic covenant. So here is the provocation and certainly you see that within Judges. It's been summarized in chapter 2. They did evil. All right, you can go through and you can see all the evil that they, they did. Yet it's uh, interesting going back to Numbers chapter 11. And in fact, we see the spirit of Yahweh coming upon individuals begins with the judges. Now we'll come back and talk about what that means. We talk about the spirit of the Lord coming upon Saul and then departing from Saul and coming upon David, coming upon David and then departing from Saul. Uh, but we'll come back to, all right, this spirit of the Lord coming upon these men is seen in Judges. But what have we already seen in Numbers with the 70? In Numbers 11. God took of his spirit and placed it upon them. 
the angel of Yahweh. That as we go through Judges, we realize just as we saw beginning in Genesis chapter 16. It's not just a representative, a messenger of Yahweh, but is Yahweh himself. See that particularly in chapter 13 at the birth narrative of the annunciation of the birth of uh, Samson. We've spoken to God himself, but God hasn't put us to death. As you go through, certainly the brutality in society. This was not an easy time to live in Israel. Uh, and, and the text doesn't hold anything back. It's almost like Judges is not for women and children. As someone has said it's kind of the PG-13 book of the Old Testament. Now, it's not R-rated, right? The, the author does not blatantly speak of Israel's sin in graphic terms. This is, this is not, I'm, I'm surprised Hollywood hasn't figured out this is, this is the next block, biblical blockbuster. I mean, they could get everything here. You know, the, you know, what two things sell movies? Blood and sex. I mean, it's both here and judges. But you see the text, all right, it, it reflects what is taking place, but it doesn't speak in graphic terms. Pulls back. But nevertheless, you can't read the text without realizing after reading the Torah and what God wanted to do within Israel, this is a disaster. This is brutal. Life was almost nothing at this point. Thousands could be slain. People could be brutalized. The corpse could be divided up and sent into the 12 tribes. And they, I mean, you just read and you realize, ick. It's a brutal time. And, and the text doesn't shy back. Gideon turns down the kingship. But Israel, as we've seen through the, the judges, is already starting to think about, do we need a human king? And uh, certainly the refrain in the appendix of the book is understand these things were taking place because there was no king in Israel. Now, there was a king, Yahweh, who had that authority, but chapter 2 has already shown Israel's not following that authority. And so this desperate situation is brought about because there's no one exercising God's authority continually and consistently throughout the land. There was no king in Israel. The result was what? Anarchy. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We, we get to talking about preaching judges. Do your own thing. Isn't that the motto of our own generation? Well, when the authority of God is not recognized... Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And uh, what is going to be the answer for Israel? God's going to establish a human king. Let us return and, uh, and speak about the... Uh, the uh, the purpose of the book, but this immediately gets us into an interpretive issue, and immediately when we get into an interpretive issue, I'd rather first talk about a little bit of the biographical resources, because obviously it's from these resources uh, that you will use to interact and uh, prayerfully come to your own decisions on these interpretive issues. Um, at this point, we lack a good solid, exegetical work on judges. Uh, probably in reading the text, you can understand why. There's a number of volumes that are in, in research process, writing process, um, but I have I found you can't pre-tell students what's going to be out in 10 years because uh, men don't accomplish their contracts and books don't come out. So rather than trying to say, uh, 
I'll give you a couple that supposedly are in press where the, the, uh, the publishers have said they have the manuscript in hand and this isn't going to come out. So we're, we're really left um, with some, uh, with, with a real hole as far as, uh, as Judges is concerned. The best work that has been reprinted and uh, even though I say exegetical, you've got to take a look at the notes. Um, and there are not a, there's not as many exegetical notes as we would wish. But uh, Leon Wood's book on distressing days of the judge, which also includes Ruth and, the, and uh, the first seven chapters of Samuel. He deals with the whole judge's period. And as I said, you, and he's one puts the, the, the notes toward the end of the chapter, at the end of each chapter as well. So, uh, could wish for more, but at least it is a foundational beginning on some of the exegetical issues. The best book to have on Judges is the book by Daniel Block in the NAC. This is now head and shoulders the, uh, the, best, uh, the best volume that is available on the book. And as an added bonus, you get Ruth as well. So, uh, But Judges, I think there's 600, about 600 pages in Judges. If I got it right here, I can tell you. Uh, yes, uh, Ruth begins, well, not quite 600. All right. Uh, Ruth begins on uh, page uh, 587. So as close as 600 pages on Judges. There, there you are. And... And uh, like, uh, like Wood, there is some significant exegetical uh, data given in the footnotes, which are in the right place at the bottom of the page. So uh, you don't have to go looking for that, uh, that material. I've already talked about uh, Davis's work, uh, exposition on judges, and a good, uh, a good synopsis. Again, we could wish there was more interpretation, but in... Uh, Lawson Younger's book in the NAVAC, uh, uh, Younger uh, uh, read uh, or did a uh, doctoral dissertation on conquest narratives in the ancient uh, Near East, and um, and is uh, now at Ted's Trinity and uh, has written a a good volume to introduce you to Ruth and give you some suggestions of principles that might uh, be foundational for preaching and contemporary application as well. So I would say get Block first, um, get Wood second, and uh, then as finances allow, when you get ready to preach, uh, get uh, Davis and uh, Younger's work as well. It is, and, and having said that, it is, it is Block's work that... Uh, and, and Dan Block's work was done as a labor of love. Uh, it's interesting, he began studying Judges not knowing that he would write a commentary. He began studying Judges for his own preaching ministry because he felt that Judges had a message that was necessary in contemporary American churches and that it was an ignored book. And as you can see from the commentaries, he was right. It is an ignored book at both the scholarly level and, at, uh, their, and also the preaching level. So that, uh, uh, so that kind of in his spare time as he was doing his uh, massive work on Ezekiel, he was doing, you know, work on, uh, on judges and then lo and behold, the NAC series comes to him and says, you know, would you like to, as a Baptist scholar, contribute something to our series? And he says, how about judges? And they said, that's great, because nobody else wants judges. And, uh, and Block asked for and uh, received it and, uh, and produced this, this, this work. Now, what he does is take issue through his study on the predominant purpose statements that, that has classically been seen in works on judges. We've already brought it out in the, the final theme, and particularly as this is seen within the flow of the, of the former prophets, 
And uh, that is that uh, the author, as he speaks of the conditions in the land and uh, gives these two narratives of first the, the, uh, the making of the idol and the, and the Danites both uh, stealing or taking the, the idol and the priest in uh, chapter 18 and then in chapters 19 to 21 with the whole incident of uh, civil war uh, and the gross immorality of uh, the men of Gibeah that uh, produces the civil war. And within these, within these narratives at the, at the beginning and then, well, twice in both of the narratives, uh, the author takes pains to emphasize the fact there is no king in Israel. I mean, you're, you're reading this and saying, how can this be? And even after reading the narrative of the events that take place, how can something this depraved be taking place in Israel? And the author, directed by the Holy Spirit, gives his analysis in these summary statements. Look, there was no king. So people are doing what is right. He emphasizes that twice, but four times there was no king. So that tied in and preparing us, obviously, as I've said, that there is a, a sense in which judges functions within the form of prophets as a bridge from Joshua all right, now there is, there is no national leader who now takes his place. There, there is the priesthood. There's the high priest. There is assumed to be the, Levi, the, the Levitical priest, the priest from Levi who will be, act in concert with a supreme judge if they follow the Torah. But, of course, the judges puts a big question mark on how well the Torah was followed during this uh, time period as far as uh, official Israel is concerned. And, and this then does become a link from Joshua, a king-like individual whom God uh, 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 leads to, to lead Israel in victory as a nation. And uh, then when we get to, uh, to Samuel, how God is going to, through the, the gross circumstances that have taken place, allow and finally in his will establish a kingship within the land. And so it's usually said, well, this demonstrates the, the need for the human monarchy. It shows why finally, you know, Israel was... Uh, yeah, the desire had been created that we have a king like all the peoples. So that it does, it, it does have this transitional role. This is the purpose of the book. I mean, if Israel maintains this kind of a society and the declension is taking place within the judges, that Israel would ultimately collapse and, though, and so therefore we have the need for the human monarchy. Block says you can't go to the end of the book. You've got to take the book as a whole. And yes, even though those, those verses are there that point to what will be historically God's solution on the human level to the problem that is announced in Judges. What is the problem? What is the problem that the king was an answer to? That's the, the purpose of the book in Bloch's mind is not to emphasize the solution, but to emphasize the problem. And so what's the problem? The problem is 
the canonization of Israel, Israelite society after conquest and settlement of the land. And God in Judges does not raise up a king. He raises up judges. This is his gracious response. And through the judge, he sustains Israel until such a time as within his sovereign plan and purpose, he brings forth a human king for the nation. So that uh, is the purpose of the book pointing to the solution or is the purpose of the book giving a narrative and analysis and an understanding, therefore, to Israel of the problem? And the fact that uh, this problem not only took place within this generation, but is a problem that continues on in later generations of Israel. This has a continuing canonical purpose, you know, in and of itself. Now, my response would be, and then you can see that a block has been, you know, written since I put my purpose statement uh, together, and I haven't changed it. I would put it this way. If you read Judges as a unit separated from its canonical context, then I think Bloch is right. Okay, the book is emphasizing the problem and God's gracious response during that time period to the problem. But I'm not so sure we can just isolate the book as an individual component, not thinking about what went before and what comes after. So that why is the text in the Bible, why is this, what would be missing if we didn't have judges? What would be missing is, is how did we get from Joshua to the demand and God's bringing forth the king. Judges does in its narrative not just speak about what happens during this time period, but it is the link. That's what we'll be missing if we didn't have judges. So I just said how much I appreciate Don, Dan Block's work. It is, super, it is head and shoulders above anything else you can have on your shelf on Judges. Study judges, read, read block, let him guide you through it. Much, much, much insight. It's really helped me to appreciate the book much more. But I'm not sure in, in, in the end that when understood within the canonical flow, that, uh, that, that is just to show canonization and God's gracious dealing with Israel during the period of the Judges. The period of the Judges becomes the link, and the author shows this, to why God will have the human monarchy in, in Israel. And so I would, I would say, yeah, this is, you know, to show that certainly is in, in Judges. But why is this shown? What is the purpose for showing us this? to demonstrate the need for the monarchy in Israel. Now, would I go to the stake for that? Probably not. Uh, if Dr. Block and I were to have a lively interaction and discussion, again, he is a great, great expositor, great debater. He might even win the debate, but I might win the election. Uh, hey, current events. But, uh, but at, at the end of the day, um, though I think Block gives us a tremendous insight into what is in the book and what it's showing, what it's relating, that's not the ultimate purpose, just to show it. It is relating it to show within Israel's history where the kingship came from and why the kingship is necessary. 
and, uh, and certainly the last word of the book. And usually, you know, looking for purpose is many times looking at the beginning or the end. And the end of the book is, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every did, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's the link between what you just read in Judges and what you're going to read in Samuel. It's the summary of the book. And when all is said and done, what have you learned? Anarchy. Because of failure of authority that God is going to rectify by raising up a dynasty to exercise his authority over his people. And the Old Testament does point to Jesus Christ. So that if there is a, a Christological thrust, if everyone says, how are you going to find, okay, you're on the road to Emmaus. Jesus goes back to the Old Testament, starting with Moses, going through all the prophets, shows how all this points to him. I would have loved to have heard his discussion on Judges. And, and I'm not sure we should take, you know, take that typological route. But there was no king in Israel. Israel needed a king. A king who would, who would curb their waywardness and exercise God's authority over them. Would, would deliver them and exercise God's, uh, God's authority over them. And, and so judges, is yet talking historically what took place. But obviously the Old Testament, the latter prophets will say that the, the first David is just, is just indicative of Israel's need for a greater David because the pattern that is seen in Judges will also then continue with the human monarchy. So in that way, there is a pattern then that God's answer was his king. There is that pattern once again of Israel turning the idols after the human monarchy is established that says God's ultimate answer to that is what? The greater David, the king. And uh, within that, uh, that pattern seen in Judges is the foreshadowing, and that's also what would lead me away from Dan Block and say, all right, since the Old Testament does, the New Testament tells us, point to, to Christ, then judges in this thrust is pointing to God's people need God's authority through a human king. And God's answer, you know, to that historically was David, and his answer to that prophetically is the greater David. And uh, so at that point, there is, there is judges fitting in to what God is doing messianically for Israel. And how and you say... Yeah, the original reason the judges could never get that. Now, what, what has already been stated within the Torah? The answer to get to Israel's waywardness, to their stubbornness, to their, to their sinfulness and rebellion against God is God sending a king. Genesis 49, Numbers 24. So that, uh, uh, and, and I think that great, great, Hebrew theologian, Hannah, when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 2, is going to show us that the faithful in Israel understood the fact that God's ultimate answer was sending the king that had been promised. Uh, and not, not David, but the king, the anointed one that uh, was going to come in the future. Now, there's a little more, obviously, sim uh, um, uh, harmony as far as the, uh, the structure of Judges is concerned. Certainly, and you have this uh, chart given to you, and I'm not going to even do the seven Judges from Dorsey. You got the chart. Uh, you'll need binoculars to see it from the back on the screen. But, uh, but as far as the structures, I... As we talked already about the, uh, uh, the books, they all end with an epilogue. Uh, Judges has an extended epilogue, uh, a lengthy epilogue, uh, an epilogue of five chapters. And uh, the author, strategically, is, is by the spirit a storyteller. 
rather than rather than saying, all right, let me just give you, all right, here basically is what was taking place. He tells two stories to tell you what was taking place during the period of, of the judges. Now, we've already introduced ourselves in chapters 1 and 2. Okay, what is foundational to understand the narrative? Israel's incomplete obedience. Or to put it a better way, their disobedience. They disobey as far as the conquest is concerned. They disobey as far as turning to idols. You just take uh, Torah. You just take what Israel was commanded to do within the Torah under Moses and uh, reassert it in, in Joshua 23 and 24. Just take that template and put it and put it over Judges 1 and 2, and you see how great the failure was. They're not a people following God's direction. They're not doing what God commanded them to do. Therefore, the consequences that God said would come, as we've already stated, came upon them. And so this is, uh, this is the disobedience. All right? Now, with that summarization in the introduction, of what took place and how that leads in then to God's response that is going to be seen during the period of the judges. Then we have the narrative of the historical cycles that have, as we said, already been given to us in, uh, in chapter 2. God has already told us the nations were left to test Israel. All right, here's the first test. The first test is that uh, the Lord, when Israel did evil, sold them, verse 8, in the hands of uh, Cushim Rishim, the king of Mesopotamia, etc. And then we get into the, the narrative of the first judge of Israel, Othniel. Now, I am not the first and not the last uh, to notice that uh, as you take a look at these, uh, at these judges, and let's now just concentrate more into these, uh, these judges. And not only the one that God raised up, but the one who sought to take the office to himself. In fact, more than a judge, he wanted to take what his father had turned down and uh, become a king with a very short-lived kingship. That's uh, almost what we call the anti-judge uh, Abimelech. When we put him and notice obviously that there is a significant portion of the narrative that is given over to his escapade as well, though not fitting into the pattern of what we see in Joshua chapter, uh, Judges chapter 2, which so is kind of an, an, an anti-judge. He is a... He is not a judge that God raises up according to this pattern, but he certainly comes forth and seeks to exercise the, uh, the, uh, the leadership over the people that uh, the judges did. Then we put him into that, that narrative. We, we notice some very interesting things that uh, when Othniel is first introduced to us in, in Judges chapter 1 is within the context of gaining a wife. So when Neil is brought before us in chapter 3, we're reminded of, well, he is the one who, uh, who uh, captures uh, the beer and so is given Caleb's daughter, Axa, for a wife. And uh, so here is a, a judge who God raised up who is known for a wife. It's interesting, the last judge, Samson, is known for his wives. And, uh, and women within his life. Yet what a contrast between Othniel and Samson. 
Othniel has one. Samson has many. Othniel implicitly one who's, who, who has discipline within his marital relationship. Samson one who lacks godly discipline in his relationship with, with women. Ahud who sends a message to the king and crosses the fords of Jordan. Like Jephthah, a message to the king who crosses the fords of Jordan. Barak, the one who is noted to have honor taken away from him because the death takes place through a woman. Abimelech, who is shamed even greater by the fact that he himself is killed by a woman. Oh, that's a shameful action, as you see both in Judges chapter 4 and, uh, and Judges chapter 9. And then in the middle, you've got Gideon. And it's significant, and you know, take a look at it, how quickly the narrative speaks of Othniel, how quickly it speaks of Ahud. And yeah, there is, there, there's a, a doublet. You have a prose narrative and then poetic, uh, 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 a poetic uh, um, statement of what had taken place in Israel victory over the Canaanites in chapters 4 and 5. But as far as narrative is concerned, you've got a very compressed narrative telling us what happened with the judgeship of Barak and, uh, and Deborah. And all of a sudden you get into the, the middle of, the, of uh, the historical cycle and you have this lengthy, almost three chapters devoted to Gideon. And... Uh, very extensive. And you get to the end of the narrative on Gideon and scratch your head and said, uh, uh, how am I supposed to interpret this? Was he or wasn't he? All right, yeah, God, you, you, you used him. But he certainly was pretty weak in faith to begin with in chapter 6. And when he finally, all right, God, I'll go, and uh, follows the Lord's orders, wins the victory. And as we said in chapter 8, he, yeah, he's very strong in, uh, in 822 when the men of Israel say, rule over us, both you and your sons, your sons, son, set up a dynasty. This is a, a request of kingship. Gideon says, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Oh, he's a good and godly man. Well, verse 27, Gideon made it when he asked for the request of the earrings, etc. He made into an ephod. Wait a minute, an ephod was the dress of the priest. What is Gideon making a, an ephod? And placed it in his city, and all Israel played the harlot with it there, so it became a snare to Gideon and his household. The way you see with Gideon is, all right, at the end of the day, was he or was he not a faithful follower of Yahweh? And of course, you got Abimelech coming forth who says, yeah, Dad might have turned down the kingship, but I'm ready to take it. He kills his uh, brothers and, uh, and acclaims himself as king. The men of Shechem dealt treasurely with Abimelech, and he suffers a shameful death. But it all goes, you know, goes back to Gideon. I mean, All right, he was a man of faith, but it now is not like the men who came before, and it's a lengthy narrative and kind of leaves us in confusion. 
And we have the same confusion as we read about Jephthah and Samson. Were they or weren't they? And of course, that's going to get us to the celebrated uh, interpretive issue on Jephthah's daughter on, on Wednesday. But then, and without getting again into the details, now, what was the period of judges like? What was it like to live in it? Let me tell you two stories. Very early, in fact, uh, possibly the grandson of Moses, which would make this the third generation, second generation within the land. Uh, they are the... Uh, they are the ones, uh, you know, verse 30, Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh. But some of the texts read Moses. We can see why they would change Moses by the third generation. Moses has an idolater within his family. Uh, so there's a very real possibility here. We're dealing, you know, very early in the period. There's a, by the second generation of the land, this kind of gross idolatry is taking place. whole tribe that uh, commits itself to idolatry. And then in Judges 19 through 21, a whole tribe that condones the grossest of immorality. This is where, this is where uh, Block is right. The, the echoes that are seen in Judges chapter 19 back to Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, it is written in language that just says, remember the Canaanites and how God judged them? It's Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis. Well, that's the level to which Israel sunk during the period of the Judges. And again, fairly early on, because by the time we get to, uh, to Samuel, the, uh, you know, Saul is coming from the house of Benjamin that's been, basically been restored. So this happens earlier rather than later on within the period of the judges. That's the kind of immorality and warfare that is a scene in Israel. And it's very interesting, the book that begins with Israel fighting the Canaanites ends with Israel fighting themselves. And uh, what a low level the, uh, uh, has, has taken place in the book. And I had to put this down in small print, but uh, Dorsey um, expands upon this, uh, uh, this basic comparison and contrast of the early and later uh, uh, judges and, uh, and uh, really comes back to, to, to get to, uh, to Gibeon, and you, uh, Gideon and you might with Block want to wrestle through that, uh, that narrative because certainly there is a change that takes place because Gideon and then the judges that come after him, the primary judges that come after him are not wholeheartedly serving the Lord as those judges that went before.